on the chat is the contrast of none of the in the middle here. On the big face together and seeing everybody meeting with everyone. I just think it's lovely here. Okay. The first reading is from Psalm 56. Uh, and it's beginning at verse 8, and it's on page 576 of the Church Bible. <clears throat> uh, record my misery. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? Then my enemies will turn back when I call for help. By this I will know that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can man do to me? I am under vows to you, my God. I will present my thank offerings to you, for you have delivered me from death, my feet stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. And the second reading is from John 11, verses, starting at verse 17, and that's on page 1078. Okay. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany, was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes me will live, who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is coming to the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the church but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at her feet, at his feet, and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. who had come along with her also he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled where have you laid him he asked come and see lord they replied jesus wept then the jews said see how he loved him but some of them said could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying <laughs> This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Okay. Do you keep that open at John chapter 11, page 178, and let's pray. Father God, we praise you for Jesus, the resurrection and the life. We ask that you would Help us to understand better what he did and what that means for us. And help us to trust him. Amen.
Well, if we were here in church for the remembrance service last week, um, we may remember reading the first 16 verses of this chapter, all part of the same incident uh, where Lazarus died and Jesus reacted to that. And just to recap on what we saw last week, um, Jesus allowed his friend to die for a greater purpose, his friend Lazarus. And it was because he loved Lazarus and his sisters that Jesus didn't go to visit as soon as he heard that Lazarus was ill. Jesus has authority over death. And uh, spoiler alert, next week we're going to read that Jesus calls the dead man and Lazarus comes out of the tomb alive again. That's the big shock in the passage that we're, we're reading these early parts of the incident in light of what we know is going to happen later. And also Jesus is not afraid to go to his own death. We saw hints at that last week in that he was determined to go to Judea, that area where Bethany was, near Jerusalem, even though the people in Jerusalem who really wanted to kill Jesus Jesus is setting his face to Jerusalem because he has a plan to go and die to save us. Now, this story, this true story, this wonderful chapter in John's Gospel, which I find amazingly moving, is not primarily about questions like how do I cope with bereavement, even though. It is really helpful to us in that, in thinking about Jesus in the context of our bereavement when we lose a loved one and thinking about our death. But it's primarily the reason that Jesus, that John has written about this, that he saw happen, is to teach us about Jesus. And some of the things Jesus said are explicitly to teach people about himself. And John, you remember, wrote at the end of John's gospel, these things are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and by believing have life in his name. So there are some things to notice about Jesus in this passage, and I'm just going to say two things. First, Jesus is the resurrection. And second, can you guess what the second one is? Life. Jesus is the life. Well done if you were looking to verse 25 for the key statement. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing me will never die. Do you believe this? So first, Jesus is the resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection. And Ian mentioned earlier that Jesus also said, I am the good shepherd. You probably remember some other I am sayings of Jesus from John's Gospel. Can you call one or two of them out? I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am good shepherd. I am the light of the world. I am the gate, and so on. And he keeps saying, I am. And those words, I am, are highly significant for anyone who has read the Old Testament as all these people that Jesus was encountering had. Because back when Moses was away from Egypt, looking after some sheep, and found a, a bush that was on fire, burning, we call it the burning bush, but it wasn't burning up. He went to investigate and a voice spoke to him and it was God speaking to him. He was on holy ground. And the Lord God gave Moses a job to do, to go to Pharaoh in Egypt and say, let my people go. 
And both are a bit nervous about having to do this. And he said, well, who, who, who shall I say has sent me? And the Lord said, I am who I am. Say, I am has sent you. And that's God's personal covenant name for his people. I am. It, it, it's so full of significance for people who know the God of the Old Testament, the Lord of Israel, who's made his covenant to rescue his people, that he exists in himself. Nobody else makes him or makes him what he is like. He is. And when, obviously, other people might say, I am, in the course of conversation, you might say, I'm hungry, or I'm going to bed for me. But Jesus keeps saying it in a very conspicuous way. I am the resurrection. And can you see what Jesus is claiming when he says that? He's identifying himself with the sovereign Lord of Israel. I am. And when he says, I am the resurrection, what is resurrection? Well, people in that, Jewish people in Jesus' time, had an understanding of resurrection. We can see that Martha knew something about resurrection because when Jesus said, Your brother will rise again, she didn't say, What does he mean? Then people will rise again. She said in verse 24, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. They understood that God was going to raise up everyone who has died, but there would be a final judgment at the last day. And Jesus is in continuity with that, but bringing a whole new understanding to what resurrection means. And the gospel of Jesus brings Christians to understand the significance of resurrection. Jesus had spoken before about resurrection, and uh, if you turn back to chapter 5 of John, keep a finger in chapter 11, but why not go back to chapter 5, verse 21. where he said, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. So he's talked about the Father raising the dead, and still in chapter 6, verse 25, very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be Condemned. So, then verse 39 as well of uh, chapter 6. This is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose. None of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son, Jesus, and believes in him, shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. So Jesus keeps talking about raising people up at the last day. There's going to be this resurrection, and Jesus has a key role in the resurrection. He's going to be the judge and the one that raises people up. God has appointed him to that. But he's saying even more than that. Now, in chapter 11, 
not just that I will raise people up and give people life, but he says, I am the resurrection. It's a bit like how he, he didn't just give people bread in that amazing miracle where 5,000 people were fed from a few little bread rolls. He said, I am the bread of life. There is no real spiritual bread apart from Jesus. And there is no resurrection without Jesus. That's him. I am the resurrection. So John is showing us by quoting Jesus' words, and Jesus is showing by what he said that he is really, really significant when it comes to life and death. Jesus is the resurrection. And those verses that we looked at mentioned not just resurrection, but life. And let's think a bit more about that. Jesus is the life. Look again at verse 25 and 26 of chapter 11. Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? The one who believes in me will live. So he's saying at the resurrection, even though you might have died before that happens, you will live if you trust in Jesus. But he's saying more than that. It's not just something in the future to live at the resurrection, but we can also enjoy resurrection this side of death now. Because he says, the one who believes in me will live even though they die and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. So when we put our trust in Jesus, we receive this eternal life, this real life, this spiritual life. That is relationship with him, the resurrection and the life. That is something that is not broken by death. It's a life that even though we die, We'll live. And um, you can start to enjoy that now. It's not saying if, if you live by believing in Jesus, you'll never die. He's not saying that you're just going to keep getting older and weaker, but never actually stop breathing. It's not saying you're not physically going to die. It's that even if and when you do die, you're not really dying because you still have eternal resurrection in life with Jesus and can look forward to being woken up, the resurrection at the last day. And so Jesus snorts at death in verse 33. When Jesus saw Mary weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. That's something, an expression, deeply moved in spirit, that um, translators find quite difficult to put into English, because it's a word that is used in, in Greek about horses when they snort. And when it's used about people, it's describing kind of indignation and anger. So Jesus is indignant. This imposter death that has come in with sin, he is confronting and dealing with. And he's dealing with unbelief which also makes him indignant. Those Jews, as John calls them, because they were Jews, he's not using the term 
Jews in any kind of derogatory way. He knows that, I mean, he's writing as a Jew himself, and he knows that Jesus is a Jew. And so uh, all those people involved there were Jews. So there's, there's no grounds for anti-Semitism in, in this. But though they had some kind of idea about resurrection, they were not seeing it in Jesus. And they imagined, those onlookers imagined, that in verse 35, when, as we saw last week looking ahead to this, two memory verses today, we've had Psalm, verse, Psalm 23, verse 6. And has anyone memorized John 11, verse 35? You should probably memorize that one today. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. When they saw Jesus weeping, their response was, see how he loved him. Which, yes, he did love him, but they, they're thinking, so he's as desperately sad as we are, isn't this awful? That young man, Lazarus, is no more by. We'll never see him again. We've lost our friend. Poor Jesus. And Jesus is indignant at this because he had he knows that he has the authority over death. He is about to bring Lazarus out as an illustration of his being, the resurrection and the life. So he he felt for Mary. And he felt for all these onlookers in their unbelief, Arab, um, indignance at their unbelief. And Jesus is, is affected by the sadness and feels sorry for them not being able to see life. But he challenges Mary and Martha and uh, Look again at his words to Martha that we've read a few times in verse 25 and 26. I am the resurrection of the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? He's not asking Martha if she believes that Lazarus is about to bounce out of the tomb, he's asking her to believe what he has just said, that he is the one in whom there is resurrection, as she's looking forward to the resurrection at the last day. And the wonderful thing is, she does. If, you, if I asked you about Mary and Martha, you might think, from what you've read elsewhere, that so uh, Mary is the uh, spiritual one, the person of faith, and Martha gets a bit of a bad press because she was complaining about Mary sitting at Jesus' feet instead of feeding the potatoes. But actually, Martha is here as an example of faith for us. She puts her trust in Jesus. She says, yes, I believe. But you, Jesus, are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. It's a, a question for us, too. Do you believe this? Do you believe Jesus is the resurrection of the life? And if you do, but you let that stink into your heart, in a way that changes your attitude to, to life and death, but drives out the fear that we have of dying, of our own mortality. That really orientates our, our priorities in life. It's all about Jesus. He is the life. Life is not how big a house can I buy 
or how nice can I get my garden or, or what school can I send my children to or, or how many friends can I get? Life is Jesus. And if we believe that when we come in a few minutes to receive bread and wine, we eat and drink as an expression of our reliance on Jesus, that life as we receive in our hearts life from him. That's practical. Heavenly Father, we praise you for Jesus, the resurrection and the life. We praise you that death is not the end. And we praise you that we can know real spiritual eternal life now as we trust in Jesus, as we rely on him. And thank you that that doesn't stop if we die, but we'll never really die and he will raise us up at the last day please strengthen our confidence in that help us to remember it may it make a difference to our hearts and lives help us when we feel afraid to remember this great truth and and please drive out those feelings of fear from us and help us to encourage one another in this. For Jesus' sake. Amen.